Hey, I'm Angie, and this is not an exaggeration. I do not know how to do a TEDx talk. You're going to listen to this and realize that I don't know what I'm talking about. You're going to think I'm a fraud. You're going to think, why did she even get the speaking slot? And worst of all, you are going to hate me. At least that's what I think you're going to do. You see, I experience imposter syndrome, something you're probably really familiar with. It's that seething feeling that you don't quite belong, and yet you have to put up a front to fit in. I feel this especially as I enter new territories in life, like a new job, a new culture, or a new job culture. And in this case, it's me becoming a TEDx UC Davis speaker, along with well-renowned influencers, activists, and scary people like Cyrus Aram. It wasn't until I started vocalizing these feelings that I realized it impacts more people than I initially thought. And everyone experiences imposter syndrome to varying degrees. You could be starting a romantic relationship with someone and you're desperately attempting to live up to the person that they think they're dating. Or maybe you join a new team at work and everyone on this team is so skilled and experienced, unlike you. And so they must have made the wrong choice. I could go on and on, but the reality is that imposter syndrome is not so much a syndrome as it is an imposter culture that deceives everyone into believing that they are the only ones experiencing it. In this talk, I'm encouraging you to delve deeper into why we feel this way. And I want to propose a solution that isn't just be more confident in yourself, because I'm asking you to do something harder to not be confident, to be vulnerable, and to be confident and comfortable in your vulnerability. And not just anywhere, but I want you to be vulnerable where you're not expected to be vulnerable. For the majority of people, it is taboo to get emotional when emotions aren't necessary, like the workplace or any professional or productive setting. Oh. Were you hurt by your colleague's harsh words? Well, you're just overthinking and letting your emotions cloud the fact that they were offering constructive criticism. Everyone else seems so calm and rational at work. Why are you so insecure? Well, those are things I've told myself before, and many of you have probably said those things to yourselves as well. There is a culture that antagonizes emotional vulnerability, especially in professional settings. And though the aim of this is to create a productive environment, we need to shift this environment into one that welcomes the expression of negative emotions like sadness, anxiety, and even frustration. There are understandable reasons why people may feel so strongly against bringing negative emotions into the workplace. Who would want to work somewhere where people are yelling or crying at the slightest inconvenience? That sounds like the opposite of a healthy work environment. And yet, there are just as many reasons to avoid a work environment that fosters only positive and no negative emotions. How this came to be. Cultural Ideals of Professionalism We consider the workplace an environment for productivity, and we set these ideals in order to optimize that productivity. The first ideal is outward positivity, inward negativity. This ideal is built from pressure to maintain a positive attitude to be able to spin anything into a positive. And what's not to like about that? Some of the most influential leaders use their charismatic optimism to inspire the people they work with. However, this ideal of outward positivity, inward negativity is dangerous when positivity is forced and negativity is suppressed. Studies have shown that public sector workers have a higher risk of alcoholism and other forms of drug abuse. These are people like hospitality workers, food service workers, and teachers. They're in jobs that demand a lot of energy and positivity in the workplace. Thus, on top of the natural strain that comes with their jobs, there's this added pressure of maintaining that positive attitude. This additional strain culminates into higher levels of stress at work, poor work performance, and reduced productivity. Now, positivity can be a powerful tool, but forced positivity is counterproductive and unhealthy. 
Enforced positivity eventually fosters imposter syndrome. Take social media, for example. People use it to highlight the best parts of their lives, sharing photos where they look attractive, sharing their latest accomplishments. They, however, don't typically share their pain, their insecurities, what makes them anxious. We tend to selectively display the positives and hide the negatives in our lives. So when someone's scrolling through an endless spiral of positivity of good things happening to other people, it becomes unsurprisingly easy to think that, well, you're not as good as everyone else, that you're the only unhappy one. Similarly, workplaces that have a culture of forced positivity make workers feel that they must direct negativity inward. And when everyone's hiding their insecurities, their anxieties, their negative emotions, it can feel like you're the only one feeling this way. I'm well aware of another glaring problem with introducing emotions into the workplace. Boundaries. Now, it is simply unprofessional to bring your personal problems into the professional sphere. Some things should just stay private. That brings me to the second ideal. Rational logic, irrational emotion. The cool, level-headed person who rarely brings up their personal life is considered more professional than the person who always has something worrying them. On first sight of emotion, we label individuals as irrational, and this is a problem for numerous reasons. First, to label emotions as irrational or unprofessional restricts how people can feel at work. Emotions are suppressed to minimize conflict and protect one's own professional branding. And out of fear of being perceived as unprofessional, people may suppress valid concerns about a project or stow away what's been bothering them for a while. This hesitation to reach out for help or openly discuss important topics stems from a fear of being perceived as emotional and therefore unprofessional. On top of that, there's an added pressure to always keep a cool head no matter what emotions you're keeping at bay. Because if you show any sign of faltering to your emotions, they're gonna know that you've been deceiving them, that you were never professional to begin with, that you were weak all along. On the contrary, expressing your emotions, even the negative ones, is neither professional nor unprofessional. It's normal. It's healthy, and it shouldn't be discouraged from the workplace. When one person expresses their emotions, it allows other people to recognize that maybe they're not the only ones feeling a certain way. So while I agree, there are some things that should stay between you and your therapist, that doesn't mean you should hide away all negative emotions at work. By entirely separating your personal and professional life and suppressing negative emotions at work, these two worlds will inevitably collide. Work problems will become topics you dwell about in personal life, and a cycle of unhappiness will exist between work and home. As is, the boundary between personal and professional life looks a bit like this. But it could look more like this. So while the two worlds have collided, it's done healthily and in a way that allows you to progress through problems in whichever environment you're in. Now, I know a lot of people who care about efficiency. Their lives revolve around committing just the right amount of time, effort, and money into the right people, things, and actions. Now, productivity is achieved through efficient means. Talking through emotions, whether it be your own or someone else's, can be a very time-consuming activity. You go in circles and sometimes you don't make any progress whatsoever. But here's why efficiency is still not a good enough reason to keep emotions out of the workplace. The introduction of emotions into the workplace allows workers to practice and develop their emotional intelligence. Numerous studies cite the work of the Department of Psychology at Qingdao University, in which employees of different ages, genders, and educational backgrounds were evaluated to find a correlation between emotional intelligence, job performance, and job burnout. This study is crucial for how to foster a better work environment because it found, with significant correlations, that emotionally intelligent workers have higher job performance and lower job burnout. 
Improving job performance and reducing job burnout are fundamental pillars to efficiency in the workplace. Efficiency and productivity aren't necessarily measured in short-term gains, but often you'll discover that they exist in long-term investments. In this case, the investment is welcoming emotions into the workplace and allowing employees to develop their emotional intelligence, improve performance, reduce burnout, and become healthier, efficient workers. Wow, I feel like such a journey capitalist for allowing you to exercise your right to be vulnerable. So, I've done a lot of talking about why we need to change this culture of no emotions in the workplace, but how do we change it? As with all cultural changes, there's only so much that you can do as an individual to make an impact, but we can always start somewhere. First, allow yourself to be vulnerable and show your emotions in personal and professional settings. Go ahead. Give yourself permission. Second, practice processing negative emotions. Just as we work out our physical muscles to enhance our physical strength, we must also work out our emotional muscles to enhance our emotional strength. Doing so gives us the experience and understanding needed to limit the harm that our emotions pose to others and ourselves. Next, use social media, both personal and professional platforms like Instagram and LinkedIn, to reach out for help and reach out to help. Pain does not have to be exclusive to you. Pain can be shared. It can be used to help you find communities who are struggling with you. Last but not least, take my favorite piece of advice from philosopher Alain de Baton. Be a better friend to yourself. Too often we think of self-care as something you serve yourself externally. A cupcake, a shopping spree, a blah blah blah. And we forget that self-care can be performed internally as well. It can be as simple as telling yourself the words you need to hear the most. By taking these steps, we are dismantling a system that antagonizes emotions as something you should be ashamed of. We are collectively admitting that we are imperfect people, and yet we're not compromising because being emotionally vulnerable is our way of learning about ourselves and growing. So, maybe you don't hate me. Maybe you didn't sit through this entire talk just to judge me. Maybe you even related to some of the things that I was feeling at the start of this video. Maybe those are things that I told myself because I was scared and I was doing something new for the first time. I'm glad I shared those anxieties with you about you hating me and not liking what I was saying. If not for myself, Maybe vocalizing those feelings helped you recognize that you're not so alone, that you are not the only imposter. <laughs>